Good morning, Pleasant Valley Church family. We would like to welcome each and every one of you this morning to live stream here in the Great Northwest. My name is Linda. I'm Tom. And we have a couple of thoughts we'd like to share with you today. This is springtime in the Great Northwest and oh, how beautiful it is. One of my favorite seasons of the year. The birds are chirping, they're busy building their nests. The flowers are blooming, which is just wonderful. And the fragrance is just so sweet and yummy. We also have the trees leafing out with gorgeous leaves that give us that nice cool shade in the summertime. It reminds me of one of my favorite songs that I hold dear to my heart called, This Is My Father's World. And in the lyrics, it states, This is my father's world and to my listening ears. All nature sings and round me rings the music of the spheres. It also continues in another verse or two of rocks and trees, of skies and seas, the morning light, the lily white, declare their master's praise. This is my father's world. Oh, let me ne'er forget that though the wrong seems oh so strong, God is the ruler yet. In this time of uncertainty, coronavirus, and despair, God has a better word. Spoken through King Solomon in Proverbs, trust in the Lord with all your heart and lean not to your own understanding. In all thy ways acknowledge him and he will direct thy paths. Yes. This is my father's world. Why should my heart be sad? The Lord is king, let the heavens ring. God reigns, let the earth be glad. God reigns, let the earth be glad. Mm. Happy Sabbath. Happy Sabbath. Happy Sabbath, PVC family. Uh, there are so many different ways that our church has been lifting up Christ uh, to all the different parts of our community. And today I am very privileged to introduce to you two special people, Hunter and Eden, who have been part of our Pathfinder program. And they're going to be joined with a couple of their uh, friends as well and leaders. So we'll be on the lookout for that in a bit. But I just wanted to ask Hunter and Eden, how long have you guys been in Pathfinders for? Well, I've been in Pathfinders for three, three years now. Yeah, and um, I've been here, well, in Pathfinders for two years. Awesome. Has it been a good experience so far? Yes, awesome. Yes, it's very awesome. I like it a lot. So tell me, like, what are some things that you've been involved in that have allowed you to be a blessing to your community? Um, some, well, what we can, what we do sometimes is we just go out and we help the community, like going to PACs and just volunteering our time uh, to just help whatever is needed. Nice. How about you, Eden? Um like participating in, event, in events and stuff like Pathfinder Sabbath, helping out. So. Nice. And you've been able to kind of get stretched a little bit. You've been on the praise team, and so you're up front leading. What has that been like for you? Um, it's really fun sort of uh, just singing with all my friends, um, leading praise service. Yeah. Awesome. Nice. And you guys were telling me a little bit of some things that you're involved in right now. Uh, what kind of honors are you learning while being in quarantine? We do, since we can't meet with each other, we do a lot of our honors on Zoom. Uh, and some of the honors we do are just like animals, like sharks and fish and... Antelope. Yeah. Just, coral reefs too. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Nice. So you guys have really amazing leaders who have been helping you in your development. Uh, just tell me about like what it's like to have good leaders, how they helped you grow, and if you could name one or two of them. Well, Mrs. Stanley is the one who uh, puts everything together, plans everything, and she really puts a lot of time and effort into the Pathfinder program. Yeah, she's a really awesome director. Awesome. Nice. And we're going to hear from her in a little bit. So thank you guys so much for sharing a little bit of your experience. And uh, thank you for being 
uh, servants of God and a friend to man as well. So keep it up. All right. Yeah. All right. So now we have Gabe Bullard Leo with us, and uh, he's been in Pathfinders for how long? Um, I've been in Pathfinders since I was ten, since I could first join. Awesome. So you're sixteen now, and yep. you are a TLT. Is that right? That's correct. Awesome. And is this your first year as a TLT? Um, this is my second year. Nice. So how has uh, becoming a Pathfinder TLT or just a Pathfinder as a whole allowed you to be a blessing to other people? Mm. Well, before I joined Pathfinders and TLT and everything, I was like this shy kid that wouldn't go and do anything. And I'd hide behind my brother. And I wouldn't really talk to anyone. Being in Pathfinders and TLT has kind of helped me get out of that shell. And um, because of it, I've been able to teach lots of different classes and make friends. And I have given, I've given a sermon because of TLT. Someone just asked me if I would give a sermon. So I was like, sure, why not? <laughs> so, like... I don't know. I'm really grateful that I'm in Pathfinders because it's just helped build my character and who I am. And it's also given me other supports to like stay focused on God. So That's awesome. I mean, it yeah. sounds like you have a lot of skills and you're able to do things that people are deathly afraid of doing. People are afraid of speaking up front and teaching. Those are like two very similar things. So, mm -hmm. um, how have your leaders in the Pathfinder group helped you uh, in your growth as a person? Hmm. Well, there's, there's this one leader that has helped me a lot, Mrs. Ivy, and she's kind of mentored me through the TLT thing, and she's, she'll like come and she'll help me mark everything off and figure out what I need to do. And um, right now, uh, right now, I've been helping her teach the companion class level for Pathfinders, and it's just been really helpful. She shows me how to teach better and how to keep people's attention. That's awesome, man. Yeah. You are going to be, an, you're already an incredible leader, and you're going to continue to be because these are the kinds of skills that will carry on with you the rest of your life. So thank mm. you so much, Gabe. I really yeah. appreciate you sharing with us. Happy Sabbath. All right, we'll see you, man. Psalms 121 verses one and two say, I look up to the mountains as my strength comes from the mountains. No, my strength comes from God who made heaven and earth and the mountains. Right now we're all going through this virus and we're not, I'm bet nobody likes it right now. And it's hard not seeing anybody and getting out and I'm sure some of us are losing our faith our hope our trust our courage and our strength well this will all go away sometime soon it won't last forever and so we need to keep all our, our faith our hope our trust our courage and especially our strength this is just the devil trying to try to get rid of all that and we're probably all losing some strength right now. Well, by trusting in God and knowing that he has a future for us all and that he will make things better, he can get rid of this easily. And so this will go away soon and we just need to pray for strength and just keep on trusting him and trust his plan that he has for us and keep our hope. Thank you for watching. So now we have Eileen Stanley with us, and Eileen has been one of our directors at PVC for the Pathfinder Group for the last 19 years. Um, and so Eileen, yeah, just tell us a little bit about your experience and what has kept you motivated for being a Pathfinder director here at PVC. I, I feel like the best answer for that is the kids. 
they're so great and they every single one of them is so wonderful and um i mean i love them all they they grow up they go to college and i can walk on walla walla's campus and run into them and they're they're all hi mrs stanley they give me hugs and it's really a lifetime relationship does it feel like they're your own kids in a sense yes it does um because as you know jenna lynn is my only daughter and i've always wanted more kids and um this gives me 50 other kids <laughs> besides just my own <laughs> that's awesome so seeing your kids, I'm gonna say that they're your kids. What has it been like to see them give their life to Jesus? And if you have like a example that has happened recently that you wanna share. Um, it's just the most awesome experience. I mean, the first time it happened, it was amazing. I mean, every time it's amazing. It's just it came as such a surprise. But at Oshkosh this year, um, on the Wednesday night of the week, which was the second nightly meeting, um, one of my pathfinders, Matthew Strawn, made his decision for Jesus, and that was truly unexpected. I, but I pray for each one of my kids, and I found out later that his parents had been praying for him too. They, when I went to tell them that he had made that decision, um, they had let me know that he, um, they were praying for him, and um, so his baptism was scheduled to be on Friday at um, 6 p.m. But Friday morning when we woke up, it was pouring rain and it was gray and the clouds were heavy and it just looked like it was gonna rain all day long and we were wet. And anyway, I overheard Matthew at breakfast saying um, that uh, maybe he won't get baptized today because I know Matthew hates to be cold and I, most of us don't like being cold. Um, and my heart just dropped mm. because I knew his parents had been praying for this and I just didn't have the heart to go to tell them that. And so I decided um, I'm not going to say a thing. I'm going to start praying. And I prayed all day long to God. And we had an open conversation about the weather. And, you know, by six o'clock, the weather was sunny and warm. <laughs> wow. That's amazing. Um, <laughs> So what was it like to see him and his, you know, just experience getting baptized? Um, it, it was amazing. Um, I, I believe we shared the video um, in church, but it, it was amazing to see his smile and his sister also got baptized. She had the most excited smile. She came out of the water. It's just, um, I, I, that's when I tell myself, this is why I do Pathfinders. That's amazing. So if you could give like one challenge or piece of advice, what would you give to any young person that would be watching this right now? Um, you know, really give your heart to Jesus while you're young. Don't wait. If, if anything is making you hesitate, don't hesitate because Jesus is the best thing in your life. He cares for you and the God who can, control the wind and the waves still controls the weather today as demonstrated by what happened for Matthew's baptism. And um, he is, he, he cares about every little detail of your life, even when you feel like he's not there, he really is. Um, so I would love for all young people to give their hearts to Jesus and truly have an experience in relationship with him that's amazing and i think hearing your story like how you view them as your kids it gives them the insight like oh wow you know that's how god views me too and the way that you were praying for the weather to hold back and um, like what more would god want to do for his own kids too so very, very cool to see how God is leading through you. Um, this isn't the only experience that you've shared with me, that it's clear that the Holy Spirit is working in your life, but I challenge anyone that's watching this right now to reach out to Eileen and ask her about more stories that uh, God has used her in her ministry to lead young people to Jesus. So thank you so much. Thank you, Eileen. Thank you for 19 going on, hopefully more than 19 years of <laughs> 
directing and co-directing at PVC? Well, I think I did tell you that um, every year I do pray that if this is where isn't where I should be, that I'm open to God sending me somewhere else. But so far, <laughs> he hasn't said I need you somewhere else. <laughs> <laughs> That's right. He keeps giving you the same answer in the same place. This is this is your home. This is your ministry here. So thank you, Eileen. I really, You're really welcome. Appreciate it. Happy Sabbath. Happy Sabbath. Thank you, Pastor Ashok, and thank you, Pathfinders, for doing such a great job sharing with the church family. Uh, I just want to say a special thank you to Eileen Stanley for all of her years of service, her brother, Dr. Alvin Nakamura, as well, and so many other adult volunteers who keep the Pathfinder Club running as such a well-oiled machine. You guys are amazing. Thank you and bless you. Boys and girls, we've been having a lot of fun with the charades. We actually had three for you this morning. But unfortunately, we're not going to be able to show you all of them this week. I promise we'll get to them next week. We do have one, though, because it goes along with Pastor George's sermon. So here it is. And leave your best guesses in the comments. You'll have to wait till the sermon to figure out if you're right or not. Have fun. Good morning, church family, and so good to see you. Happy Sabbath to you. Um, been looking forward all week to being together again and to being able to open the Word of God together and to seek His face. So let's just pray together as we, as we open God's Word. Lord God, we just thank you again for this privilege to be together in the name of Jesus. We thank you again for the truth as it is in Jesus, and as we Look at Jesus this day, Lord. May we indeed see what it means to be, to be a neighbor, to be one who loves the way Jesus loves. So, Lord, please send your Holy Spirit to us as we open these holy scriptures. This is our prayer in the name of Christ. Amen. So, this COVID-19 quarantine, I've got to tell you, has uh, given me some new experiences. I know for you, too. I mean, you know, to walk out and see people in masks everywhere, this, this is different. I know for me, uh, on my morning walks, uh, I've had an experience here that just kind of kind of drew me up short, caught me by surprise, but I'm walking down the sidewalk, and I see a neighbor that I've known for the last how many years, you know, and I see this neighbor, and as we're walking toward each other, suddenly my neighbor kind of like veers off and leaves the sidewalk and goes out and walks in the middle of the street in order to distance from me, and it just caught me by surprise. I thought, whoa. And uh, here I am, I'm walking along with my dog and going down on the path through the woods behind our house. And someone's coming, and they, someone's coming the other direction toward me. And as, I, as we approach, suddenly this person sees me and, and takes their dog and pulls their dog and by the leash and off they go out into the woods, like 10, 20 feet deep in the woods. And, and I wave from a distance as I go by and say, good morning. This whole thing of, of us doing social distancing is really, it just catches me by surprise. I'm not used to this. I'm used to people coming up and engaging each other and saying hi to each other. And it struck me the other day as another neighbor, this time a, a lady with her mask on, saw me and she stepped off the street, out, you know, stepped off the sidewalk out into the street. And it just struck me. I thought, wow, I think I'm starting to get it where how the lepers used to feel back in the stories there with Jesus and the Gospels. And how it was for that man who had been on the road to Jericho, how he'd been robbed and left there half dead on the road, how the people as they came 
to him and saw him, they swung around the other side and, as the scripture says, passed by the other side of the road. So let's just pick up that story in, in Luke chapter 10, and we'll begin there in verse 25. And behold, a lawyer stood up to put him to the test, saying, Teacher, what shall I do to inherit eternal life? Now, the first thing we want to say about this man's question is, is this is a good question. This is the right question to ask. Um, it's interesting in, in Luke, both in Luke as well as in Acts, you have this question raised several times. Acts chapter 2 on the day of Pentecost, after Peter's message, and he says, you know, you have crucified the one that the, one, that the Father made the Savior of the world. You crucified him, and you, he made him Lord of your life. You crucified him, and the people, they, 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 they just go, brothers, what shall we do? You know, they're asking the question, what do we do? Uh, the jailer, the Philippian jailer, when you read that story and following the earthquake and the jailer comes out and he falls on his knees before Paul and Silas and he asks the question, what must I do to be saved? That's the most important question to ask in the whole world. So when we hear this lawyer begin by asking the question, teacher, what shall I do to inherit eternal life? We go, hey, that's the right question. But then we notice that it says here that the lawyer stood up to put him to the test. What does that mean, to put him to the test? Well, what it means tragically is that he was not genuinely seeking to be taught by Jesus. He was involved in a setup, trying to get, do a gotcha on Jesus. Even though he's asking the right question, he has the wrong motivation behind it. We'll see that more as we go into the story. So what does Jesus respond in verse 26, and he says to him, Jesus says to the lawyer, what is written in the law? How do you read it? Isn't it interesting that when asked the question, what must we do to inherit eternal life? Jesus turns right to, it is written. I mean, for Jesus, the word of God, how did he say it there when he was being tempted in the desert? We don't live by bread alone, but by every word that comes from the mouth of God. So he asked this man, he says, what is written in the law? How do you read it? And then he responds and says, you shall love the Lord your God with all your heart and with all your soul and with all your strength and with all your mind and your neighbor as yourself. And Jesus answers him and says to him, you have answered correctly. Do this and you will live. I mean, the guy, he asks a good question even though he's not asking you it from a genuine seeking after Jesus' teaching. But he asked the right question. And when Jesus responds, how do you read this? This man responds and gives the correct answer. I mean, he goes right to the heart of it. And the heart of it is to love God with all your heart, soul, mind, and strength, to love your neighbor as yourself. He's right there. And Jesus hears him. He looks right at him. He says, good answer. Now, go and do it and you'll have eternal life. Go do this, and you'll have eternal life. And the lawyer takes a step back, because in verse 29, what do we see him saying? But he, desiring to justify himself, he desiring to justify himself. Isn't this interesting? When Jesus says, hey, you've answered correctly. Love God, love your neighbor. Love God, love your neighbor. When he says that, the man instead of saying, oh, good, begins to go into defense mode. He, he becomes a defense lawyer for himself. He makes the case for himself because he desires to justify himself in the way that he's living his life, the way he's living this thing out, the way he's living out the commands of the Torah. And what does he say? He says, you have answered correctly, says Jesus, do this and you will live. But he, desiring to justify himself, said to Jesus, and who is my neighbor? It's almost like, huh? Like he's like, he's copping an attitude like, yeah, just, okay, so just who is my neighbor? You know, what's the point you're going to make here? Notice something that's happening here. He is posturing in saying, who is my neighbor? What this man is doing is posturing some people as, some people as, quote unquote, 
non-neighbors. And if you can posture someone as a non-neighbor, then that's a person who can be treated as less than. Let me repeat that. If you can posture someone as a non-neighbor, that is an individual that you and I can then posture as a less than person. Jesus hears this man's statement. And he goes into the story, into the parable of what we call the Good Samaritan. It begins in verse 30. Jesus replied, a man who was going down from Jerusalem to Jericho. By the way, that road from Jerusalem to Jericho, I've had the privilege to actually be on that road, coming from Jericho up to Jerusalem and back the other way as well. I got to tell you, that's 3,200 feet of elevation change from the height up in Jerusalem all the way down there to Jericho. And it takes about 18 miles. It's, a, it's, it's wild country. It's like being out in the John Day fossil bed somewhere. It's it's crazy wild place. This man is taking a journey from Jerusalem to Jericho. He's by himself. And robbers see that. And they the thieves, they come out and they, they take him down. In fact, re, look what the story says. He fell among robbers who stripped him and beat him and departed, leaving him half dead. Verse 31. Now by chance, a priest was going down that road. And when he saw him, he passed by on the other side. There it is. There it is. He's coming toward the, down the road toward this man. He sees him there, left half dead on the road. And what does he do? He passes by. He goes by on the other side of the road in order to avoid any contact with this man. And he could justify himself. See, this is a this is a core, this is a kind of a default human kind of position that we take to justify. He could justify and say, hey, I'm headed for the temple. I've got to serve. If this man's dead, I've touched a dead person. I, I won't be able to serve because I will have then been become impure, ceremonially unclean. Now he, he could justify his action. He passed by on the other side of the road. By the way, uh, this parable that Jesus is telling is not very flattering for two professions, lawyers and, and preachers. It's lawyers and preachers that Jesus is speaking to here in terms of the way that they're relating to this question about neighbor. Let, let's keep going on with the story here. So likewise, a Levite. Now, a Levite would be someone who was not from the family of Aaron, but was part of the same tribe. And he's someone who would serve at the temple also. The same reasons he could justify not caring for this man. When he came to the place, he saw him and passed by on the other side. Verse 33, but a Samaritan. Boom. This is where Jesus really, really drops, you know, drops the other shoe. This is the one where the lawyer and all who are listening are going, what? Are you kidding me? A Samaritan? I mean, Jews and Samaritans had such deep-seated hatred for each other. And the, the Jews despised the, despised the Samaritans, and the Samaritans returned the favor. I mean, it's, this was the gift that kept on giving back and forth to each other. And when he said, but a Samaritan, what Jesus is actually doing is setting up, he's setting up this story in such a way that he can illustrate what he has said before just a few chapters earlier in the Sermon on the Mount when he said, love your enemies. He said, love, uh, yeah, anybody can love your friends. I'm saying to you, says Jesus, love your enemies. And now in this story, he is illustrating this as the Samaritan who naturally would not go and care for a wounded Jew on the road. But this Samaritan, as he journeyed, came to where he was, and when he saw him, he had compassion. This man had compassion on the man who had been beaten and left there half dead. Verse 34, he, not passed by the other side of the road, he went to him. Those beautiful words. He went to him. And it goes on to say, Jesus goes on to say, and bound up his wounds, pouring on oil and wine. Then he set him on his own animal, and brought him to an inn and took care of him. We're talking a real costly engagement here where he's given time, he's giving energy, and he's getting off his own, his own donkey and putting 
putting this man who's been wounded on that animal and taking him to an inn, and he's there with him through the day and through the night. And how do we know that? Because it's on verse 35, it says, and the next day he took out two denarii. That's two days, that's two days worth of labor. He takes out two denarii and he gave them to the innkeeper and he said, take care of him. Whatever more you spend, I will repay you when I come back. What a picture. What a picture of answering in Jesus' story to answer that question, who is my neighbor? And Jesus now turns again to the lawyer and asks this question. Which of these three, the priest, the Levite, the Samaritan, which of these three do you think proved to be a neighbor to the man who fell among the robbers? I imagine there was a pause. And then the man said, he can't even get the word Samaritan out of his mouth. But the man said, the one who showed him mercy. And what does Jesus say? You go and do likewise. Go and do the same. Go live like this. You're telling me, you've asked the question, what must I do to inherit eternal life? And I asked you, what do you read in the Torah, says Jesus. And the man says, love God and love your neighbor. Jesus says, go love like this. Go love like this. And as he lays this out for the man, what he's really saying to this man is this. He's actually correcting the question. All the way along, you know, this man asked the right question. What must I do to inherit eternal life? That's the right question. He even gave the right answer. Love God, love man. But at this point, when he asked the question, who is my neighbor? That's the wrong question. And Jesus is gently but pointedly correcting the question. The question is not, who is my neighbor? The true question is, how can I be a neighbor? How can I be a neighbor to this man, to any man, to any woman, to any child? How can I be a true neighbor? How can I be a loving neighbor? That's the right question. It's the question that wasn't asked, but it's the question that you and I are being invited to ask as we read this story. Now, I have a question for you. And my question to you is this. In this story, who is the true good Samaritan? This is just a story that Jesus told, but who is the true good Samaritan? I want to argue that the true good Samaritan is the one who shows mercy that the true good Samaritan is the one who, in fact, on our picture there in Pleasant Valley, and I hope you can see this very clearly, but our picture got it right. Who is the true good Samaritan? The true good Samaritan is the one who was on the cross, the one who's come down from the cross, not the two who have walked away, but the one who is there cradling the man who needs a neighbor. Jesus is the true good Samaritan. He's the true good Samaritan. And the cross shows us the how. It shows us the how to be a good neighbor is that we unite with Christ. We unite with him in his, we unite with him in his dying and in his rising his dying and his rising, and united with him in his dying and in his rising, and empowered by the Holy Spirit, who pours into us the fruits of the Spirit, which is love, joy, and peace, but love is the first and is the greatest. That's how you and I become loving neighbors, true loving neighbors, true good Samaritans. That's how you and I love like Jesus loves. Let's pray together. Lord God, Thank you. Thank you for this picture, this amazing picture of what it means to love our neighbor. Not to ask who our neighbor is, but ask the question, how can I be a true and loving neighbor? How can I, like Jesus, be like that true good Samaritan? How can I live a life that your love flows through me to be a blessing to the other? In Jesus' name, thank you. We say yes to your call. Please pour your spirit into our lives and the fruit of the spirit, which is love, that your light might shine through us into this world 
your light that shines into the darkness and blesses others, your light that shines into the darkness, and the darkness can never overcome it. Our prayer, this is our prayer this day, and we thank you in the name of Jesus. Amen. Hi, PVC. Hope you're all doing well. I just wanted to give a quick intro to this next song. Uh, a few weeks ago, I believe it was the, the first week of, of lockdown, I tuned in to PVC live stream and watched church. And uh, listening to the, the pastors and Penny read from uh, Psalms and read from Luke, uh, the verse that, was, that stuck out to me in Psalms was, was wait on the Lord. And, uh, and then the story um, in the Gospels was when Jesus calmed the storm. And uh, for some reason, it just, I reflected back to an experience I had uh, back in my commercial fishing days in Alaska. Uh, we used to fish in, in the passes where there's very strong currents and, and wash rocks and islands and uh, fairly dangerous. And uh, this one particular time um, caught in a situation where I didn't think I was going to make it through. And just that, that weight on the Lord, it's, it's such a, this, this story or this, this experience was, uh, I guess, such a, a metaphor for, for tough times. And I think, I think we all have these, um, you know, experience these parables in our life that, that uh, are applicable to, to other times. And, uh, you know, maybe, maybe sometimes God gives us these experiences in, in the past to, to use in present times or in the future. Um, anyway, I put this little song together and I want to thank Mick for, for helping me out. Um, and I hope you all enjoy it. And I hope it's a blessing. Happy Sabbath. It's the top of the flood. It's already turned. The ebb is running wild. You think that I
Pastor George, we've been talking week by week about faithfulness in stewardship and just reminding all of us together that worship includes giving. And uh, I was just thinking about the importance of the posture of our hearts. And, you know, we, we can spend time right now looking down in the mouth and, and just being discouraged about things, but we can also choose to posture our hearts in Thanksgiving. And uh, so we, and in fact, we can do that whether we're in need or whether our needs have all been met, because we can choose along with Paul to, to, to be content in any circumstance. And uh, so just, just uh, choosing today, I, I'm choosing today. I know you are and, and encouraging our church family to choose today to, to, to posture our hearts with thanksgiving for the blessings that God has poured out on us. Yes. That, yes. You know, you think about the challenges that individuals and each of us is meeting. And, and I'm thinking again of the, the posture of our heart where uh, the apostle Paul says to rejoice in the Lord always. And again, I say rejoice even in the midst of this COVID crisis uh, that we, that we, as we look at turn our eyes upon Jesus, that, uh, that we find reason to rejoice and no matter what we're facing. And we're, we're just so grateful for the continued generosity of our congregation, tithes, offerings, our local budget. Uh, these are all needs that, that have real life impact. Um, we're praying for you know, just the world church all around the world. We just think about the way the lives are being impacted everywhere. So again, thank you for, for your generosity and your, you, the God who is so generous to us that we give back with generosity that just blesses us and we get to be a blessing to others. Yeah. So whether the stimulus check arrived or not, we can, uh, we can posture our hearts with Thanksgiving and, um, and church family, if you're in a place where you're, where you're experiencing need right now, we want to know because we're together in this, we're doing life together. And right. as a part of our faith community commitment, we, we want to meet each other's needs and as the Lord has provided generously into our lives. So, um, yeah, let's bow, our, let's bow our heads and just pray together as a church family right now. Lord, we thank you for the privilege of worshiping together. And we come to you as our Father, God, and Jesus, our brother, Holy Spirit, our comforter, our counselor. We just thank you for your presence in our lives. We thank you for the, the many blessings that you have poured out. And Lord, we're, we're in awe when we think about the ways that you love us and demonstrate your love to us. And so we lift up worship to you today. We confess our need for, uh, for Jesus. Like daily, minute by minute, we need your presence, your Holy Spirit presence in our lives, Lord, to guide us and to direct us. And we thank you that we, we get that, um, that gift, the comforter, the counselor has come to us and, and lives in our hearts. And so we thank you for that. We thank you that because of the blood of Jesus, we've been made right with you. We thank you that when we confess our sins to you, you're, you're faithful and just, and you always forgive. You set us right. And thank you that by one sacrifice, by the sacrifice of Jesus, we've been made perfect forever. And Lord, we just live in that reality, and we live in that reality with confidence and dependence upon you. Lord, we lift up to you prayer requests today. And um, we, we know that there are those who um, have need of healing amongst us. And we pray for, we pray for Carrie Nolsher. We pray for Judy Doty and Judy Shaler, Terry Brown. We also lift up Liana and Randy Dopp. All of these are, are people whom we love and people whom you love. We ask that your Holy Spirit would comfort them and would touch them and bring healing to them. We just thank you for your presence and we ask that it would be tangibly felt. We pray for the James family and we just, Lord, we pray that your Holy Spirit would be close uh, there as well. We, we lift up, we lift up Joan, Joni to you. And um, Lord, we pray also for those who, um, who have lost uh, a loved one recently. We pray for Jeannie Dasher and Brenda Marazon, for, for Sam Vigil and for the Miller family. Amen. Lord, be with these families and just we thank you that you're close to us in our grief. Father, thank you for the ways that you are, are at work in our church family and for the ways that we see uh, others loving and serving. And we're inspired to, to be more, more loving and to follow you in, uh, in, in greater ways. And we ask that you would continue to lead us and guide us, Lord. Thank you for 
uh, your divine leading, the ways that you open doors and close doors and, and guide us in our lives. And we ask that you would continue to do that, that we would be faithful to you and that this church would, would continue to be a community of faith where, um, where people come to know you, but where also we live together in, in, in harmony through the Holy Spirit to follow according to your plan for us, Lord. And we, we can't wait till Jesus comes again and we ask that you'll keep us faithful until then. In, in your name we pray, Lord. Amen. 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 Happy Sabbath, everyone. It is good to be together. And I'm so thankful that we get the opportunity to join together with Laura Pasco and Stephanie Leonco. Pastor George and I here uh, looking forward to a conversation about Portland Adventist Community Services. And so it, we'll be referring to it as PAX during this interview. Uh, maybe you've heard of PAX, maybe you haven't, but Laura Pasco is the executive director of PAX. And I, I want to start by just asking Laura to tell us just a little bit about PAX, maybe a few facts and figures, and uh, what, what ministry you guys are doing there at, at PAX. Yeah, uh, thank you so much for the opportunity to come and talk today. Um, we, are, we are full in action. It's a little bit different now than um, what it is normally. So I'll start with normal and then flip to where we are. We are um, a food bank. We also have a mobile food pantry that goes out to um, communities that don't have access to a food pantry. We have a low cost dental clinic and we have two thrift stores. So that is what we do on a normal day. Um, this current crisis has turned that a bit around and um, we are now doing a drive-through food pantry and we are um, taking boxes out to homebound seniors and those that are on quarantine or that are immune uh, that are worried about their immune system um, and can't get out so that's what we have been doing the last what is it seven weeks now time kind of runs together pax so, has been has been a huge blessing in the portland uh community and and uh your your location is uh on on halsey right uh yep halsey and 111 and how long have you been North in East operation Park. in portland uh since 1934 wow so this is a long-standing thing and wow. and uh for those yeah. for those people who are who are familiar with how adventist community services works in in many congregations it's it's church by church but in portland yeah. the adventist churches in portland decided to try to join together and accomplish maybe a greater thing than than what we could do individually and so there's a lot of churches that uh that include pleasant valley but a lot of other yes. churches that that have banded together in order to make pax uh, what it is today it's a really neat uh a really neat uh organization a really neat campus and uh in when when the time is appropriate maybe i'd encourage people to stop by and see what's what's happening there meet laura and uh yeah. Yeah, so definitely not business as usual. Um, you guys have been serving a lot of people there. Um, uh, how many people? How many people have you been serving day by day during the COVID nineteen shutdown? So um, every day we tend to break a new record, which um, is just becoming the new normal. On an average day, we would serve anywhere between um, sixty to ninety families normally. Um, Yesterday was our record for families, and we had 135 that were served. Um, today we had 127. So, and so, you, you're talking, you're talking that you had 127 cars that came through to cars pick up. That came through. So, in terms of actual people that are being served, those families represented. You were saying somewhere sure. over 500 a day. Over 500, over 500 people, under five, over 500 people a day being served in, in terms of food. Yeah. And I was just thinking about 129, 135 cars. That's I mean, that's amazing. a, that's a lineup of cars, almost a quarter mile long. It is. And you know what? This is a, it's a fine tuned machine. I have to say it is when I walk in there, it is buzzing and it is humming and it's a God thing to see how smooth it works. Um, our team in there, believe it or not, we're only open for two hours each morning. We're open from nine to 11 for our drive through food pantry. Um, and so if you think of that timing wise, um, 135 cars in just a little over two hours, um, that's like a car a minute. Uh, so we are, we are flying through and you know, we have seen God, I have seen God personally show up in so many ways at PAX. 
um, before this crisis started, but I think it has intensified um, since this crisis started. And um, back in mid-March, we were starting, there was talk, there was chatter, right? This kind of came up slowly. It started coming into all of our awareness. Um, and I was walking around on a Friday afternoon and I went into our food pantry and we had told people you need to social distance. We had tape on the ground showing how far six feet was when they were waiting to come through. We have a shopping style pantry because we really at PAX, we love um, our mission is to serve with and show people compassion and dignity like Christ, to, to use his ministry as a blueprint. And so we want to give people dignity and we feel like letting them go through and have a grocery store shopping experience like um, anyone else has is something that we can give to them. So that is normally how we function. Um, but that Friday afternoon, as I was walking through the food pantry, we were trying our best to keep people six feet apart. Um, and to be perfectly honest, we were failing epically. And um, I just thought to myself, I thought, we cannot do this. This is not responsible. There could be people coughing. This, this is not socially responsible. We have got to turn this around. Um, so that weekend, um, that Sunday morning, I actually called our whole staff together. I ca called them and said, either we're, you need to come in on Zoom. That was my first Zoom meeting. If only I knew there were gonna be a lot more. Um, but either you can call in on Zoom or you be here in person. And this was on a Sunday morning and we are not usually open that early on a Sunday morning. Um, we need to turn this around and spin it. And we did to a drive through food pantry. Um, but one of the ways that I show, saw God show up was that Saturday afternoon, um, I got a text from a, a guy that I have worked with that I know well. He works at the Oregon Conference. Some of you might know him. His name is uh, Fernando Chavez. And mm -hmm. he is, yeah. he's a great guy anyway. And he just texted me and he said, hey, Laura, all of my work traveling around to schools for the conference has dried up, obviously, because we had started the, to head towards the stay home by then. Um, he said, is there any chance that you need some help at PAX on Monday morning? And truthfully, I didn't know what I was even saying when I said yes, but God prodded me to quickly say, yes, thank you so much. If you could come in at 8.30, we'd be thrilled to have you. Um, do you want to know, Fernando has showed up every single day that our, that our food pantry has been open. And it's not just him. It is so many people. But that is, God has showed up through the volunteers that they don't have to be there. Towards the beginning, there was a lot of anxiety. There was a lot of fear about getting out of our houses. Right. Um, mm -hmm. And it was my job. I needed to show up. That was my job to do that. But so many of our volunteers, they were simply doing it because they wanted to be um, the hands and feet of Jesus. They wanted to invest in those families in our community. And it has been such an amazing experience to see how these volunteers and our staff have worked together to make um, this new system fly. Wow. Wow. What a, what a picture. I just thought, I love the way that the, what, what's happening that, that you are there. And as you talked, we were talking more about 129 cars, 135 cars, all those people, 500 people, you clearly, at, at PAX, you are very, very clear that you don't ask the question, who is our neighbor? You're really mm. stepping up to that whole piece of how can I show the love of Christ to my neighbor? I just love the, love the way that your engagement and engagement with all those who are volunteers, like, like Stephanie here with us as well. Yeah, speaking yeah. of Stephanie, uh, I know you've mentioned a couple of times how the, the team has come together in a big way. And all of us mm -hmm. have been processing, you know, the changes um, in, in, you know, in different at different levels some some people yeah. have, have uh, not had their employment impacted to the to the extent that others have stephanie you're one of the ones that uh, your your employment has been impacted in a pretty significant way yeah so i recently got furloughed a couple weeks ago now i think five and um when i when i first got the news that i would be furloughed i wasn't sure what to do honestly um and the moment i thought that I saw the post that I think it was Katie put on PAX and was like, Hey, if you, if you need something to do, PAX is taking volunteers and they would love to have you. So I texted her real quick. 
hey, I'm free. When do you need me? <laughs> That's awesome, Stephanie. Uh, well, you you work you working in healthcare. A lot of times, you know, we think, well, during a time like this, healthcare jobs are completely secure, but your job working in orthotics and prosthetics is is a job that um, was uh, was required you to be furloughed right now. And uh, yeah. thank you for thank you for stepping outside of the bounds of just you know staying at home and chilling, um, and yeah. and and committing to to be making a difference, to volunteering, to trying to to love others. And uh, I know that I see Laura nodding her head. I know that it means a great deal to Laura that folks are taking the initiative to to get out mm -hmm. and and be able to serve. So. It's awesome that you're joining. Tell, tell, just give us a little picture for those of us who, um, who may wonder what what do you do? Like, are you are you like handing out food boxes and giving hugs? To, oh, you're not giving hugs. What what, no, are, you no. doing? <laughs> what are you doing? What are you doing uh, day by day when you're volunteering at PAX? Yeah. So um, there are two shifts that you could work when you're at PAX. You there's the first shift where you're distributing the food boxes. That's in the morning. That's where you see the 100 plus cars. Uh, and then there's the second shift where you restock, and that's where I come in. Um, the shelves themselves are, they look pretty bare when I come in, and then the things that I do is I restock the shelves so that the boarding people are able to put the foods back in the big boxes and are able to very quickly distribute them, like Laura was saying, as a well-oiled machine back out to the car so that you only do like a minute per car and you can do that very quickly so uh making sure that the the shelves themselves are very stocked and they're easily accessible for the people who are filling boxes um i've done some cleaning as well they've put they've put me to work they have definitely put me to work <laughs> i have come home a couple times sore because of just the repetitive motions of you know stocking the shelves each can's like not even a pound, but if you do that three, four hundred times, it starts mm -hmm. to really add up very quickly. So, well, thank you for taking taking hits for yeah. the team. And uh, Stephanie, I know, I know. Um, so it sounds like your work has been pretty much behind the scenes, and it might be tempting to think, you know, it's just a grind, um, and that there's not really much in the way of personal satisfaction or reward that goes into that. How have how has that experience been for you so far? Um, it's weird not being able to see a person and like see the impact like directly like the, the impact that I have directly to them um, as a healthcare professional it's really easy to be like here's the patient in front of me and here's how I'm affecting their lives and get that direct feedback of thank you for helping me this is what you're doing for me um, so in terms of like seeing an actual human it's been a little different but when you know, I, I hear the statistics of how many families we've been serving, how many people we've been serving, how bare the shelves are at <laughs> the end of each shift and like how much I am putting back onto the shelves. It's, that's where I find like the most impact, just knowing like in the numbers, in the visual representation of there's no food on the shelf. Um, that's how I know that what I'm doing is, is impacting others. Yeah. 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 You, you have, you know, every touch that you, that you put onto one of those pieces of, uh, you know, canned goods or whatever is it is, is a life that you're, that you're impacting and you have a part in every story that gets told from coming out of this experience. And, right. and PAX does have some stories. We're, uh, we're excited to be able to hear from Laura. Um, Laura, share with us may, maybe a story or two um, that of lives that have been impacted in the ways that you're seeing God work through the ministry of PAX right now. Sure. Um, I have a plethora, so I'll, I'll just pick a few. Um, maybe, well, I, so I have, I have two short ones. The first one is a gentleman that received a food box from us, um, and he needed food, and he had received a food box from us. Um, maybe if I could describe what we give, we give, yeah. if you know how big a banana box is, we mm -hmm. give out two banana boxes to every family that comes. One is filled mm -hmm. with shelf stable stuff. So that's beans, rice, tomato sauce, peanut butter, um, crackers, cereal, pasta, you name it. That's what's in a shelf stable box. And then we give out um, a fresh box and that will have milk and eggs and cheese and uh, meat, produce, fruit, potatoes, onions, all that kind of thing. Mm -hmm. um, so each family that comes through gets two boxes. Um, they get the shelf stable box and they get the fresh box. Um, so he got a lot of food 
And through that, he was able to take what he needed. And he also helped um, his daughter. He took stuff over to his daughter. He took stuff over to his mom and to his sister and all of their households. Uh, he was really touched by that. And he was so grateful. And uh, he actually contacted us and said, um, you know, I am on a fixed income. And yet this meant the world to me. I am so grateful for the food that you gave us. We just got our stimulus check. And um, I would like to meet you because I would like to give you $240 out of my stimulus check because I know that you will use that money to go um, to help other people and help them the way that I was helped. And that wow. really touched me yeah. that um, he, out of out of what he had that is so valuable to him that he was so grateful for, he felt that much thankfulness for the food that he got that he wanted to, to pay it forward. So let me say a quick word about the value of those boxes. Mm -hmm. um, through some investigation on our accountant's part, we figured out that the value of those boxes averages um, $150. And I wish that I could be there and ask you all to vote and guess, but I won't. I will just tell you the amount that it actually costs packs in dollars and cents of how much we have to pay for that food um, is $1.96. Um, wow. So just the way that we have yeah. contracts with the Oregon Food Bank and grocery stores and what we get donated, um, we are so grateful to be able to eat put that food out in an efficient monetary way. And so it, it wow. seems like it makes a lot more sense uh, rather than if I wanted to help and provide food, rather than going out and buying a jar of peanut butter and donating it, it makes yeah. more sense for me to donate money and the, the dollars go a lot farther because of food donations and other things in, in PAX hands. Is that right? Yeah, exactly. Oh, that's good yeah. to know. Good to know. One other story that I just thought of was we had a gal come through line and you know our our intake person just asked how did you hear about PAX, and she said, "Well, actually, yeah, I've never heard of PAX. I'm just on a I'm on a group online chat community, and I noticed that a gal that lives close to me said she really needed food and she couldn't go out and get any, and so I private messaged her and said, "Hey, I live pretty close. I can get you food." what do you need? Where do you want me to go? And she gave me the address of PAX and now I'm going to go drop this off. And so the person clarified and said, wait, you're taking food to someone you've never met. And she said, I am, they need it. And they're in my neighborhood and I can do that. Um, and I just feel like we have gotten a front seat to the best part of humanity sitting at PAX. We see people showing up every day um, willing to give up themselves and that are that are also needing that assistance and yet when they get that assistance they are willing to pass it on to somebody else because they are so grateful um, mm -hmm. and I have been personally that has impacted me really profoundly of of how people show up when they come here and what, what gratitude can do Wow I hear some exciting things are happening, Laura, as we come to the month of May and maybe some expanded ways of that we even as local churches can be involved. Yeah, absolutely. Um, so we have been given a grant from the governor. I don't know, you might have heard on the news that the governor gave Kate Brown, uh, ten. Uh, the, Kate Brown, the governor, she gave the Oregon Food Bank um, eight million dollars to make sure that food was getting into the community. So um, they have given us that grant. It's only for food, um, but they have given us an amount that we can spend on food to try to help and expand who we are able to give food to. So we are looking for partners. The first thing that we wanted to do was come to our constituent churches and say, hey, can we partner with you? Is there, is there needs in your community that we can help you show up to your neighbors and your community? And so we are looking forward to ways that we can do that with Pleasant Valley right now. I'm excited to talk a little bit more about that in just a second, um, ways that we can partner together. But I wanna stay on the money topic for just one uh, one more minute. Um, 
first of all, I just want to clarify that the grant that you mentioned, $8 million from the Oregon governor, is specifically a food grant for PACs. Is that correct? That is correct. They gave the, the Oregon Food Bank divvied it out to 29 agencies in the state of Oregon, and PACs was one of them, so we are fortunate. But yes, they did. They gave us money, but it can only be spent on food. It cannot be spent on anything other than food. So I, I, wanted, I really wanted to clarify that because you, PAC still has an operating budget that they need to meet and you have salaries to pay and there are a lot of volunteers there, but you also have full-time staff members that are on salary. And uh, so I wanted to just make, make it clear to, to anybody watching that PAC is still, still is appreciative of any monies that are donated. Uh, that story that you told about that man, um, if any of us want to join in on that, um, and I know that, that many, many, uh, uh, folks do contribute directly to PACs. And uh, I wanted to just yeah. uh, mention the fact that you have had an ongoing fundraiser that's been happening through Give Lively. And uh, I know that I've shared that out on social media. We've shared on the church's uh, social media. But if I wanted to make a donation to the operating expenses of PACs, um, how, how would I be able to do that? Yeah, we would, we would absolutely love that. The thing is, is our, our operating funds normally come from the thrift stores. And um, we chose to be a socially responsible small business in the area and close those down along with um, all of the other stores like us in the area. We are looking forward to when we can open, but that is not happening yet. So yeah, we would absolutely love it. We, are, we have been experiencing some hard times. Um, so there's two ways to donate. You can go to our website. Um, or you can text the words PAX family, that's P-A-C-S family, um, and you text it to the number 44321, and um, it will pop back a, a menu that you can donate. We would love that. Thanks so much. It's a secure way to donate, and uh, it's really okay. easy to do. I trialed it out a few weeks ago, and I know personally that it works, and I just want to invite um, folks to be able to support PAX. We we as a church, um, Pleasant Valley Church, um, provides a subsidy to PAX monthly, and, and it's something that we believe in and support. I know that there's a team of volunteers uh, uh, led by rock stars like Stephanie uh, from Pleasant Valley's Young Adult uh, Ministry that um, are volunteering, and I know that you mentioned earlier how much you've appreciated the team from, from, from PVC. There has been so many faces, and many of you know that we used to attend Pleasant Valley before we moved up to Vancouver. So it still feels like home to me. And I see so many friendly faces here at PAX. Um, we have had so many people show up and volunteer their time or their resources. We had a really neat one this week um, that somebody just ordered a bunch of pet food, full-size uh, cat food and dog food bags from Amazon and had it delivered. And, um, you know, our four-legged friends need to eat too. And those people were so grateful to get that donation. So um, PVC has really been an integral part of the well-oiled machine that we've discussed. And we are, we are thrilled and we are so grateful. Thank you. Oh, and we had another one of your Sabbath school classes that came in too. And I think almost everybody in the Sabbath school class came in and made some rounds. So yeah, there has been a lot of friendly faces. If people want to join in uh, it, with the, the volunteer crew, um, how's the best way for them to get connected with that? Sure. So we actually started an email account just for this, um, just for this event, trying to track all of the details. So um, it's PACS, P-A-C-S, food2020 at gmail.com. Cool. PACS, food2020 and at gmail.com. Yep, that's the way. And that is, that's how we're streamlining all the requests that just have to do with this COVID um, crisis. And so, yeah, we have a schedule and we would be, we would be grateful to have some people fill it out. Cool. We, we, um, we want to end with just one quick, uh, maybe we'll call it a teaser about something that we, we actually discussed whether we were going to talk about this or not, because there's still some pieces to come together. We don't want to yeah. over promise, but we're excited about being able to partner with PAX uh, and Pleasant Valley Church together to bless um, a local organization. Um, over the last couple of years, PVC has gotten involved with the Pleasant Valley Elementary School, which is over on 172nd, just just outside of the, um, sorry, it's on, it's on Foster, on just, Foster, just, just yeah. past the 172nd turnoff. Um, and 
one of the things we've done some coat drives, we've done socks and underwear. We about the the PVC young adults have been working um, under mm -hmm. uh, Lindsay Seibel's leadership and have created a program to address food insecurity in that school. And I know that um, Maureen Granger and Lindsay Seibel were excited about being able to partner with them and that school counselor to actually get some of that that food money donation appropriated yeah. to to be able to get food into the hands of kids at Pleasant Valley Elementary School. So we're excited about that in the future. Yeah, absolutely. We Like you said, we don't know exactly what it's going to look like yet, um, but we feel a real responsibility at PACS to take this additional um, grant money that we have to expand our reach. And there's no better way to do that than um, through our constituent churches and seeing if we can help um, you guys meet needs of people in your own communities and um, be able to be the hands and feet of Jesus and strengthen the fabric of the communities where you guys are meeting. So we look That's forward awesome. to seeing what that looks like. Stay tuned. It's awesome. Thank you so much, Laura, mm -hmm. for serving in the name of Jesus. Stephanie, thank yeah. you so much for letting your hands be mm -hmm. the hands of Jesus. And uh, I'm wondering, Pastor George, if you would just say a prayer for Laura and Stephanie yeah. and for all of the team at PAX that are delivering yeah. ministry services to people. Let's pray. Lord God, thank you so much for this privilege to be together in the name of Jesus, to serve together in the name of Jesus. And I just thank you so much for PAX. Thank you for Laura and her entire team. For Stephanie, who represents all those who come as volunteers and give all those hours and all that energy. And Lord, we are so grateful now for the, for the ministry of PAX during this COVID crisis. Thank you, Lord, for all the families that have been able to be impacted and blessed and to be able to have food on their tables. And Lord, help us, help us as we seek how we can be, can be neighbors, the good neighbor, the good Samaritan type of neighbor to bless others in Jesus' name. Yeah. And so may your blessing continue and may Jesus' love be a love that shines throughout this community. Thank you for the privilege of being part of what you're doing in this world. Be part of your hands and feet together in the heart of Christ that lifts up others and sees no one as lesser than, that serves each one in Jesus' name is our prayer. Amen. Amen. Yes.